Good morning, students. Uh, welcome to the uh, August 23rd, 2022 Commissioner Student Advisory Council meeting. We're going to just start with a quick roll call and then I will kick it off to the commissioner. Um, just very quickly, if you have access to the chat, you could please type in your first name and last name and just type in uh, the word here. H-E-R-E. -E. Very quick roll call. Uh, Tony. Yes. I do not have access to the chat for some reason. We will mark you present. Okay, thank you. And I will see if I can fix that on my end. <laughs> Hi, Tony. I also don't have access to the chat right now either. Okay, and who is this speaking? Anastasia. Anastasia, okay. All right, and while you guys uh, continue to check in, I will kick it off to the commissioner so we can get started on our agenda and I will share the screen of the agenda there, Commissioner. Thanks, Tony. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. We would love to see you in person, but I know this is much more convenient uh, for everyone since all of you are uh, scattered across the state. Um, but we look forward to our next in-person meeting as well. And we appreciate the work that some of you have done over the summer on the policy brief that you were uh, pulling together. Um, I'll just update you on uh, a few things. And, and um, one is that uh, school has gotten open um, across the state. We have districts that are already back in session or, or have plans soon to be. That seems to have gone pretty smoothly. Uh, potentially, this is our first uninterrupted year of learning since the 2019-2020 school year. So I think everyone's excited about the prospect of that. Um, certainly, there are still COVID outbreaks happening, people getting sick, uh, students getting sick, uh, teachers getting sick. Um, but we know that the variant of COVID that's uh, being passed around now is much less dangerous than the one uh, from two years ago. And we have vaccines widely available now, too. So that seems to be making things operate a little more smoothly, although some disruptions still keep taking place. Of course, the one area where that's um, not happening uh, is the flood impacted districts in eastern Kentucky. And I saw that we had that on our agenda um, uh, up ahead. Um, so, Tony, should I go ahead and talk about that now or, or, or hold on? Yeah, sure. We can um, we can go into that if you would like. I just wanted to just update student uh, as the commissioner knows, we had initially 18 um, school districts that were impacted and we've uh, additionally, as of I think this week, added an additional five. So we're at 25 um, of our 175 school districts that have been impacted by flooding. Um, and so, yeah, you can go go right ahead. I just had a slide from Hunter that um, kind of shares the um, that shares the, uh, and I can get to that when you mention it. I'll I'll pop that up on the screen for him. Okay, great. Well, uh, maybe we can have Hunter on or some of our Eastern Kentucky students to relay some of their experiences. Um, so. Oh, I think, as you mentioned, Tony, we had 25 districts impacted in some way. Um, the most heavily impacted from a school operation standpoint were Breathitt, Letcher, Knott, and Perry counties. Um, Letcher County uh, probably being the most extensively damaged, but all of those counties had some kind of school impact. It's been more disruptive to school operations than even the tornadoes that impacted Western Kentucky in December, because in, in Western Kentucky, while you had extensive damage to residential and commercial areas, the school buildings were primarily uh, or largely left uh, un undamaged. There were some minor wind damages. Uh, we had one district that lost some buses um, in the tornadoes, but the school buildings were largely undamaged. In, we in Eastern Kentucky, in the floods, you've got school buildings that were extensively flooded. And so many of you have seen the pictures of those or, or been in those buildings. Uh, yourselves. The range of those damages goes from uh, where water came in, and so you have mud and water damage and potentially some uh, drywall damage. If the water got higher, you were impacting uh, furniture, fixtures, equipment, uh, possibly uh, walls, electrical systems, uh, ventilation systems. Uh, and then uh, even more extreme, we had some damages to structural aspects of buildings. So that kind of is the range of what schools are looking at 
when it comes to how they have to mitigate these. Can, so the questions are, can they come in and sort of clean it up? Uh, are there uh, some um, systems that have to be replaced or do you have structural damages where you actually have to take parts of buildings down and reconstruct them? Uh, and there's a range, range of all that in, in all the counties uh, that, that I mentioned. So uh, we're looking forward to a uh, special session of the legislature that I think will happen uh, here imminently. We're not sure exactly when, but we're getting close on that, we believe, uh, that we'll look to provide some financial assistance to the flood impacted districts as they did to the Western Kentucky tornado impacted districts, and uh, also some greater flexibility in terms of um, uh, the number of, of days that uh, these schools need to remain in session. Uh, we They all have plans on when they will open. Uh, or, or they're already open, but uh, some of them may have, have a hard time uh, getting and staying open because, uh, for example, they've got wastewater problems in their communities and you can't operate a school building if you don't have a sewer system that's operating. Um, so, so things like that that are coming up and as they continue looking through and working through the damages to the buildings, uh, you, you find new things all the time. It, it changes almost daily. Uh, so we'll look forward to that special session and some support and flexibility these districts uh, may get from the from the legislature. The Kentucky Department of Education has been involved in <clears throat> uh, the drafts of the initial legislation, but of course the General Assembly will be the ones that ultimately make the decision around what sort of flexibility uh, and support these, these districts will will have. And I expect that they'll uh, do some things that will be very supportive of, of what's going on in Eastern Kentucky. Um, so I'll pause there before moving on and uh, and see if a hunter or some of our students that are in Eastern Kentucky want to come on and just talk some about their experiences and what's going on in their communities and sort of where things are today. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't really care to speak about it. Um, Thank you. So I'm I'm Hunter Combs. I'm from Knott County Central High School. Um, we were impacted pretty severely. And one of the things that I've kind of been thinking about is, and I mentioned this in my article, I was thinking a lot of people use school as a safe place. People go to school to kind of get away from things they'd be worrying about. And a lot of people find safety in school and find, I know, mean, like for me, I love school because I got to see my friends and knowing that a lot of my friends don't have houses has kind of been really scary. Um, so I think my main thing also that I'm kind of pushed to people is school is an amazing thing. Like I have grown up in the schools. I loved my schools. I wanted to be a teacher my entire life. And I just want people to know that this a lot of, I know some people have looked at it saying, hey, we're out of school for two months. Like, you know, we're not going to go to school. Like, yay. There's not too much enjoyment from this. Um, so I feel I have, honestly. Thanks, Hunter. And uh, we've heard from uh, the students and from the administrators and teachers there that they desperately want to get back in session. Um, they, they want school to get going again. It establishes a sense of uh, normalcy in the community and people just miss each other and want to see each other. Uh, so I think there's there's hard work happening in all of the communities around uh, getting back back open. Uh, Hunter, uh, what's the latest on when Knott County is planning on on coming back? We've heard, I know we've heard earlier than, no, like, no earlier than September 19th. That's mm -hmm. kind of been the date we've had for a couple weeks. I've heard some people, we may be pushing more towards October 1st. Um, I think they're discussing virtual. I haven't heard too much from, like, the superintendent, Brent Hoover, on that. But, cause, like, one thing we're worried about is our laptops that the school is providing were inside of a conference room. And there was two foot of water in that conference room. So no one knows kind of the state of that, but I've heard no earlier than the 19th of September, it could push to October 1st, though, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, that's what well, we've heard some of that too. And I know Superintendent Hoover, we've been in contact with him on a weekly basis, not County Central, uh, heavily damaged, Heinemann Elementary, another uh, school that was that was heavily damaged. Uh, we got some good news at Knott County uh, Central High School in that it wasn't as, uh, there weren't structural damages to it, but still the uh, flood damages are extensive. And I think one of the challenges in, in your community has been the wastewater system uh, and trying to get that back up and running. So we, we heard, we've heard some positive 
positive things along that line too that that may be up sooner uh, than later. But it, like like I was saying before, it seems like every day there's a new challenge or something different that comes up as we find out more. Uh, Hunter, um, how about any of your your friends or uh, relatives? Any of them uh, directly impacted that you've been able to uh, hear from? Yeah, um, basically all of my family, all my friends live here. So I know a lot of them have been affected. Um, a couple of my friends have lost their houses, which has kind of been a little scary. Um, but I definitely know that some of my family has been kind of dealing with, because a big problem here is a lot of our roads have been heavily damaged. A lot of people for the first couple of days leading up to weeks of the flooding couldn't get out, didn't have the ability to go anywhere. Um, I guess another thing with the schools is a lot of people, some of like our roads are not good. And if there's not a road there, you can't get to school. You don't have the ability, like if the school is to provide laptops, you can't get to the school to go get them. Um, but I know that basically everyone I know was impacted in their own little way. Some people, like here, even in my house, we were affected. Um, we're currently looking at moving just because of like structural damages here. but. Yeah, everyone was affected in their own like tiny little way where it was like, you know, you lost a couple of things or some friends of mine lost everything, would lose houses and have had to move and they don't know what the future is looking. They don't know if they're going to try and salvage the house, if they're going to just move away from here. Like, it's really, there's a lot of what ifs and we're kind of just waiting to see how the future pans out with that. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, and we have heard a lot about the roads being impacted and then long term questions around uh, jobs and homes and where people will end up uh, settling. Of course, a lot of families in in your region uh, have been there for for many years and it, it's home and and they have deep roots in the in the communities. But uh, with this kind of disruption there, uh, we're also hearing discussions around people leaving and not coming back and uh, what that might uh, mean for the long term population of the communities and the schools. So lots of questions uh, right now, but also lots of support coming in. And uh, we have heard from all the school leaders in, in eastern Kentucky, again, just desperate work to try and get open and establish some kind of normalcy and connection uh, for people. People, especially after these past couple of years of really disrupted school, there's an extra urgency uh, to get back open and and do some things um, to establish normalcy. Um, others, other um, district that we know was heavily impacted was was Perry County. They of course lost the whole Buckhorn School, which is a K-12 school, uh, and another um, another elementary school um, lost as well. Uh, they're having to relocate those students into other buildings or actually reopen a building that had been closed for many years uh, and, and get that open. So, so they're on track uh, to do that. Um, Breath of County's made good progress, but they had extensive damage on their uh, central campus. Uh, and uh, Letcher County is is still the one I think, from a school operation standpoint, uh, uh, had had some of the worst damage. Uh, so real question marks ahead of what's what uh, school operations are going to look like uh, for them. Any uh, other students that are on that were in uh, flood impacted regions or that were uh, connected to someone flood impacted? They just want to uh, relate their experience. And then Hunter, I did I did want to ask, and if anybody does, just please raise your hand. You know, from your perspective, from a from a student perspective, I know there's a lot of uh, your fellow students on this advisory that are probably wondering, you know, what can we do to help? Is there something that we can do to help? And I know several have volunteered with KEDC or some of the cooperatives. And you know, is from your eyes, you know, what what can the community or what can what can people do to help? Uh, your families or your your neighbors in, in Knott County. What what do you see is needed right now? That would be a really good question. So I have to think on uh, one of the biggest things for me since I'm kind of really like into the uh, KDE is I've loved watching the superintendent huddles every week. They have been I know for us like it's been really useful to kind of know from our superintendent how are our schools looking like what are we that's really our only way because our school really hasn't been communicating too much. They said September 19th, but they've not told us any of the damages to the schools. So being on the impacted superintendent huddle and watching those when they're streamed has really helped us be up to date with what's happening. Um, 
in ways that you can support us. I haven't particularly thought too much on that. I will have to think on that and reach out to you later about that. But that is, I do appreciate you guys wanting to help. Because for a lot of people, you know, I know such as for me, I've lived here my entire life. Like, I've never not known a life that is in Eastern Kentucky that is in this school district. I mean, my parents went here. My, all my siblings, like, we've lived in this county and lived in not Central and lived at Hyman Elementary my entire life, their entire lives. Um, so you guys wanting to help support us has been, like, it honestly meant the world to me. It makes me kind of emotional to think about. But I'll just think about ways that people can help support us, honestly. Please do and just shoot me an email and we really appreciate your, and I just can't explain or can't describe how grateful we are for you to, to reach out to us almost immediately and ask, um, you know, how you can get your words out and to to write the op-ed. It's not easy to write, you know, an op-ed for a publication and you did such a wonderful job and I think your voice was shared uh, just so elo eloquently uh, and I've heard so many uh, kudos to you. So, so thank you for sharing, uh, for sharing that. Thanks, Hunter. Right. Um, and thanks, Tony. And I just did wonder if there were any other um, uh, students on who either they were directly impacted or they had family members, just anyone else that, that would like to share anything. Okay, hearing hearing none, uh, just to echo what uh, Tony said, Hunter, we're really uh, proud of the op-ed that you put together and telling that story of your experience, I think was really important. And we'll continue with those superintendent huddles. Uh, I think that lots of folks are tuning in to get uh, up-to-date information on a weekly basis, just as things are changing uh, in those in those communities. Uh, and we are expecting a special session coming up uh, that will provide some additional support from the state to, uh, that, to your region. Um, looking ahead, and I think leading us into uh, some of the work that we we have today uh, beyond the special session and into the uh, short regular session that we have coming up in starting in january uh, it's a it's a shorter session so this won't be a budget session so we don't expect any major shifts or changes from a, a financial standpoint uh, in state spending over this next year uh, so the legislature has a long session where they deal with the budget and then a shorter session where they uh, tend to focus more on um, policy issues particularly those that are um, more have uh, some urgency to them uh, we are expecting uh, and hearing conversation around uh, trying to get something started around support Support for the teaching profession uh, from an education uh, standpoint or an education policy standpoint. Um, there, uh, of course, are um, uh, concerns around teacher shortages and uh, it, the lack of available qualified uh, personnel, uh, both in the regular teaching roles and substitute teaching roles, and then in other support positions that operate in districts. Uh, all those things are, are of concern. Um, we had a presentation this summer to the Interim Joint Committee on Education, so that's the House and the Senate's uh, Education uh, Committee. They meet together on a monthly basis. One of their sessions was around the status of the teaching profession. We were able to show uh, the decline in the number of people entering the teaching profession, um, an increased reliance on emergency certifications uh, for filling uh, uh, teaching jobs, and some national data around um, shortages that that. Uh, we thought we would see this fall. I don't know that it's been as bad in Kentucky as it has been in some other states, uh, but I have heard from superintendents that they were really less able to be choosy at the point of hiring, uh, that they had fewer uh, candidates that were applying, and so sometimes they were taking um, whoever was whoever they thought they could get that was qualified to do do the role. And in, in cases where they couldn't do that, they're relying on emergency certification. So those are concerning trends that we want to do something about. We gave the legislature some ideas on, on steps that they could take to uh, help stabilize that. They are listening and we're hopeful that um, we'll see some progress around supports for the teaching profession take place uh, beginning this fall, but uh, po possibly leading into the next biennium where there's a ch uh, opportunity to do more with the, with the budget. Uh, of course, also and uh, related to the work that you'll do today, um, lots of concern in the wake of the Uvalde uh, shooting and what else could Kentucky do that would 
uh, help make our schools uh, as safe as they possibly can be. Uh, so there's conversations around uh, steps, next steps related to school safety uh, in the state. Uh, I think your recommendations around that will be valuable uh, addition to that conversation. You have an opportunity to really weigh in when our legislators are uh, listening and paying attention uh, and looking for new ideas around how they could better secure schools. And as we discussed earlier, when we met about this a few months ago, um, the student voice on this topic, I think, is uh, has largely been a void. Uh, we need to hear more about what students think on this topic uh, and get that get that voice in as well. Um, so I think uh, those cover the updates that I have, just uh, where we are right now and looking ahead. Uh, Tony, let's shift back to the rest of the agenda. I don't want to make sure we don't um, uh, take in all any of the time that we need for the policy work they're going to do. Perfect. Um, so we just have a quick um, John Pace. I think he's on. Is John? John, I think I, I am here. I'm you here. are here. Yes. There you are. Good morning. And there you are. It's like the genie that just pops up. <laughs> <laughs> um, John is here to just give an update to our students um, on Educators Rising Kentucky, and I will toss it over to him real quick. Well, thank you so much, Tony, and thank you all for having me here and giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. As Dr. Glass just mentioned, uh, one of the issues is teacher shortages. Well, one of the things we're doing here uh, in, in my division, the Division of Educator Recruitment and Development, is to uh, encourage people to consider careers in teaching, and that goes uh, from as young as high school students, which is my work, to all the way to career changers and also professional development through national board certification. Our whole division covers that. So uh, Educators Rising, if you've not heard of it, it's the career and technical student organization um, that has existed under several names and has been sponsored by a, a number of organizations over the course of its history. Uh, the National Education Association first founded uh, Future Teachers of America in 1937, uh, and, that, and its purpose was to inspire young people to consider careers in education. Now, in the mid 1980s, uh, the organization's name changed to Future Educator, excuse me, Future Educators of America. Uh, and in 1994, Phi Delta Kappa uh, International took the lead on FEA and provided it with an international headquarters. And in 2005, PDK changed the name to Future Educators Association to more accurately reflect uh, an international nature of its organization. And in 2015, FEA changed its name to its current name, Educators Rising, uh, and defined as one of seven divisions of PDK International. Now, in this incarnation, it set pre-service standards. It built an entire curriculum and created tools to advance the education profession at an earlier age. Now, presently, Educators Rising is almost exclusively PDK's focus, and it continues to support future educators build resources, uh, provide aspiring educators an opportunity to explore the field of education as a career path, and to grow uh, diversity in the workforce. Uh, something that is desperately needed uh, is to diversify our workforce, to bring more people of color, to bring uh, uh, bring more men into the organization. Um, teaching is predominantly uh, uh, staffed by by females, but bringing more more guys into education. So any of you guys out there, I uh, might want to consider uh, education as a career. Next slide, please. So its purpose for uh, the individual is to help acquire, help students acquire knowledge and skills in the educational sciences, and this is done both in a classroom setting and also in um, out getting students out into an actual classroom working with a cooperating teacher. It's kind of like student teaching for high schoolers. Um, it gives you an opportunity to uh, step onto the other side of the desk, as it were, and to see what it's like to actually teach somebody. And then you get feedback and you do reflection, just like your, your classroom teachers do. It's designed to help you develop leadership and other essential skills. Being someone who's been on the management side of things, whenever I'm looking for something, somebody uh, to fill a spot, I'm not just looking for technical skills, but I'm also looking for those soft skills, those interpersonal skills, those interpersonal skills, the ability uh, basically to play nice with others, as they say, uh, to be able to problem solve and things like that. Everything that's needed to be a good teacher and also to apply learn knowledge and skills in the classroom and also in com competition events. We're going to talk about that in a minute. 
So benef- some of the benefits of this organization for students are they get to network with other Educators Rising members across the state and nation. Uh, they get to participate in competitive events, very, uh, very uh, strong com- competitive events. I'm going to talk about that in a second. They get to explore a career path and prepare for admittance to an educator preparation program. And I'm a big proponent of career exploration starting as early as the sixth grade. You know, by the time you get out of high school, it's a good idea to know what you want to do uh, and where you want to go and what you want to do with your life. Uh, you get to develop and apply leadership skills through involvement in your local chapter, also at the state and national levels. Uh, you get to serve in elected state and national student leadership positions, and there's lots of scholarships. There's about 130 scholarships that uh, Educators Rising has available for aspiring educators. Next slide, please. So our two biggest events of the year are, of course, our, our state uh, conference and competition. It's always held in the first week of March, and this, week, uh, this year it's going to be held uh, March 2nd. Uh, again, at Bellarmine University, one of our education preparation providers. Uh, and there are 21 competition categories. And these categories range from uh, uh, lesson planning and development in, in various uh, content areas. Uh, we have uh, several public speaking events. We have, uh, we have, um, excuse me, some impromptu speaking events where you are basically given a prompt and you get to just uh, develop your your notes and talk for uh, a good uh, five minutes about a subject. We have um, one of my favorite ones is uh, a public speaking event called Educators Rising Moment. And that is where students really get to tell their moment where they decided they wanted to be an educator. And some of these are just really Beautiful stories, stories, everything ranging from a student who, you know, used to in second grade, they used to line up their stuffed animals and teach their stuffed animals to some really uh, heartfelt and deep presentations about how a student uh, was helped significantly by a teacher and then they wanted to pay that forward. We also have several uh, professional development um, events, breakout sessions. This past year, we had a wonderful keynote address by the 2022 uh, Kentucky Teacher of the Year, Willie Taylor Carver. Our own Dr. Glass did a lovely presentation himself. We also had a college panel uh, to talk to students about what it's like to major in education. This is a great opportunity to network with other students to know that you're not alone out there and that there are other people who are pursuing uh, the same career and passion for teaching. Uh, this also is an opportunity to, where we uh, raise student voice through uh, a lot of students doing presentations. And this year we are uh, encouraging students to run for a state office uh, at, at our uh, 23 uh, state convention. Next slide. And this year uh, I got to attend the first live state con- uh, national conference that uh, in two years, it was held uh, June 24th through the 27th in Washington, D.C. It's the largest uh, Ed Rising National Conference ever. Uh, We had over 1,200 students uh, and we had over 1,800 participants with uh, teacher leaders and presenters. Uh, Even the deputy um, secretary of education came and offered uh, her keynote address. We had 11 students uh, who finished in semifinal rounds out of 1,200 students, and we had four Kentucky students who were uh, national finalists. And I've included a link there in the uh, in the slides um, that uh, has all of our semifinalists. But I want to brag a little bit on our, our folks who finished uh, in the finals. And if I could have the next slide, please. So Anthony Ramsey and Nyla Porter from Central High Career Academy in Jefferson County, they took second place in children's literature in the pre-K junior varsity division. Next slide. We had Solela Grace Elliott Gonzalez from Ballard High in Jefferson County. She took third place in impromptu lesson plan in the varsity division. If you know Solela, I'm sure some of you do. And next slide. 
and Annalene Cook from Lincoln County High. She took third place in impromptu speaking in the junior varsity division, and and competition was fierce. I was actually judging uh, at rising the Educators Rising Moment competition, and there were actually two rooms because it's such a popular uh, competition. But competition was fierce. So uh, I just wanted to brag on these students a little bit. They they had some hard competition, but they brought home some uh, some awards for Kentucky. So go Kentucky. Uh, the next slide, I just wanted to share a brief video uh, from the national conference and uh, let you just take a look what it uh, what was what it was like to be there and see if you can spot me in the slide. I'm in there somewhere. Um, I have a question. Yes. Not that one. Someone. Um, so I'm interested in this. Is this more of a uh, based off of your high school chapter or how can we uh, get involved if we want to pursue this? OK, um, if you have uh, if you are interested uh, yourself, where where are you at and who am I talking to, by the way? Uh, sorry, uh, I'm Luke Taylor. I'm a senior at Davis County High School in Owensboro, Kentucky. OK, OK. Um, if if you don't uh, have a chapter at your high school um, and off the top of my head, I, I don't know, we have 96 chapters throughout the uh, throughout the Commonwealth, um, but you can actually join as an individual and I can uh, put some information in there. And all you need is one uh, one of your teachers just to sponsor you as an individual and set up a chapter at your school. Uh, but we've had several students uh, who started uh, chapters uh, at their school and, and they're thriving. Um, Audrey Gilbert at Frankfurt High, uh, she started her own chapter and is going, uh, and is going gangbusters over there. Um, Courtney Ashton, uh, you're gonna see a picture of both of them later. Uh, she was uh, in Pike County and she started a chapter there. So you can you can start a chapter and if and I'll have my contact information at the end of this presentation and you can reach out to me and I can share you that information. Great question. Thank you so much. I think I'm good to go. All right. As much as I'm sure you all wanted to see my tweets. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry I should have told you, Tony. My 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 bad. <laughs> Mea culpa. That's okay. I wasn't. I just. I thought it was a picture. I was like, it's kind of a blurry photo, and then I realized it was a video. So, um, all right, here we go. So it was a really great time. We had um, lots of fun. 
uh, very serious competitions, but you could also see in the video we had some social events. We had a lip sync battle. We had a karaoke room. It was a it was a great conference. And this next year's is going to be in Orlando. So I'm going to bust out my mouse ears and get ready to go to Disney after that. So um, I talked a little bit about student leaders and leadership opportunities. Uh, everything from the chapter level all the way up to national level. Uh, chapters are led by the students. Uh, it is a career and technical, I underline the word student organization. And so this is an opportunity for you to step up and uh, have your voice be heard uh, if you're leading your chapter. Uh, Kentucky has always had great representation at the national level uh, with, uh, with student officers. Uh, and ambassadors this last year, Courtney Ashton, she was the VP of programs. She's currently a sophomore at Lindsay Wilson College, majoring in education, of course. <clears throat> and Audrey Gilbert, she's a national student ambassador uh, for Educators Rising. She did that last year. She did such a great job. They asked her back this year, uh, and she'll be a student ambassador um, for uh, Educators Rising at the national level. Uh, this year, the next slide, please. Uh, COVID had hit us hard, and I was hired one month before we went into uh, before we went into COVID, and so uh, that that hit us hard, and we kind of limped through COVID years, but we're back really strong. Uh, and this year, uh, I'm inaugurating uh, state officers into uh, the organization, and these folks will help launch uh, our our state officer program to run Educators Rising. Uh, and the uh, qualifications for that are uh, they have to be a current uh, Educators Rising member in good standing. Uh, that's at the national level. Uh, they need to be uh, one year in Educators Rising or any other career and technical student organization, such as FFA or DECA, or if you're in Beta Club and have been at the leadership position, anything like that um, also qualifies you. You need a, a, a teacher's recommendation. And uh, some of the duties that these students will be uh, participating in is they will help plan the state conference. They will take an active part in the state conference. They're actually going to be leading uh, most of the sessions. They're going to MC. I'm going to step back this year and, and let them uh, take the reins. And uh, they're also uh, going to be Educators Rising Ambassadors for Kentucky. It's pretty simple to apply. There's one form to fill out, and I've included a link here uh, in this presentation as well. Uh, next slide. And to assist any students who are interested in leadership uh, in Educators Rising, I'm hosting a leadership uh, student leadership training that's going to be held virtually on September 6th. It's going to run from 9 to noon Eastern time. And the topics are going to include uh, parliamentary procedure, recording minutes, ideas for chapter meetings. Uh, we're also going to talk about service projects, a uh, big topic this year uh, in Educators Rising, how to create an agenda, mentoring new chapter members, and, and a number more. And I notice I didn't put the chat there, but I will put that very quickly. I think I have that up here. I'll put that link right there in the chat. Next slide. And are there any questions, any other questions that you have for me? All right. Well, not hearing we, anything. We can make Thank sure, you very much. John, we'll make sure to put all of your, your follow-up information um, in an email in the Google. Many of you all who are uh, returning members will know that we send out the um, exit slip. It'll have a lot of information. Just check out the email from me and we'll make sure you have all this information. Um, and I think it's really important, even um, you know, if you're looking for an activity in high school, even if you're not actually, of course, we, well, we want all of you to become teachers. <laughs> um, but even if you're not, this is great leadership skills for, um, for any job that you may mm -hmm. be interested in doing. So Absolutely. Uh, very proud of all, all of you all. So thank you all very much. Thank you, John. And um, Thank you for taking the time this morning. Thank you for having me. It's, it's been my pleasure entirely. Thank you so much. All right. I think up next we have Christina Weeder. Christina? I know I saw her. Yes, good morning. Good um, morning. How are you? Good morning. Uh, so I have to I have to admit that since I got a new computer last week, anytime I try to turn my video on, it likes to disconnect me from the internet. So 
for the moment while we're present, I'm doing the presentation, I'm going to leave my video off if that's okay. And then sure. I'll try to turn it on later when it might be less risky to, <laughs> to disconnect. Um, sure. So good morning. It's it's nice to, to see all of you. Uh, my name is Christina Weeder. I'm the director of the Division of Student Success um, in our Office of Continuous Improvement and Support. And um, we do a lot of work related to uh, school safety, school mental health, um, among other things. Um, and so I wanted to give you just a very quick overview of the School Safety and Resiliency Act because I know you all have been doing some really important work on making some recommendations around school safety. And um, there's a lot of information in the, the uh, legislation that has been passed in the few past few years. So I wanted to just highlight a few of the key points that uh, you may or may not have come across in your research for your recommendations. Um, so next slide, please. This is just a very quick um, overview of the timeline of some school safety work in the past several years. Um, <clears throat> and so this was actually um, on the mind of leaders um, across the state, not just in education, um, since uh, 2017. That's when our state interagency counselor or our SEAC uh, voted unanimously to establish a uh, social emotional health uh, task force. It was um, actually proposed by our then um, education commissioner, uh, who was chair of the SEAC at the time. And um, it really, he really felt like we needed to focus across our agencies on social emotional uh, learning and well being. Um, and so that was initiated. And then just a, a few short months after that is when we had the unfortunate tragedy at Marshall County High School. Um, and so I think that really um, propelled uh, some of this work into the spotlight. Um, Shortly after that is when the task force began their monthly meetings and simultaneously while that was going on, the legislature created a school safety working group that was uh, co-chaired by uh, Senator Wise and Representative Carney, but there was also a student member that was a part of that working group. And so they met for about six months, uh, touring the state, listening to people um, talk about their perspectives, um, around school safety and school mental health. And then they kind of concluded their working group in December of 2018. And then the following spring is when they passed uh, Senate Bill 1, which was the, the School Safety and Resiliency Act. Um, and in that act, you know, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about, there was a lot of work uh, assigned to several different state agencies, including KDE. Um, but there was no formal structure to um, facilitate the collaboration among those agencies. So we created uh, some of the, the folks in those different agencies created an, an informal um, implementation team in July of 2019. Um, we continue to meet, I think at this point we're meeting roughly quarterly, just to continue to stay in contact about the progress and any additional tweaks that might be needed to legislation. Um, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, any any recommendations that you have, we can also try to share with with that um, implementation team. And so then uh, that fall, um, the social emotional health task force finalized its recommendations and its recommendations were really for the different state agencies that comprise this the SEAC, um, but in many ways are aligned with with um, some of the things that are in the School Safety and Resiliency Act, particularly around uh, psychological safety. Um, so then in February of 2020, they passed another uh, uh, bill, Senate Bill 8, that created some updates for the School Safety and Resiliency Act. And then in the most recent session in 2022, they also created some additional um, adjustments to the act um, and passed some additional legislation related to uh, mental health absences um, for students who were, you know, wanted to have excused absences for mental health purposes, um, some additional legislation related to school resource officers and district operated police forces, and then some data collection around the school based mental health services providers. So perhaps more detail than you needed, but I think it's, it's sometimes helpful to have that uh, big picture overview about 
the fact that this has been on legislators radar for the past um, several years. And I think especially because of COVID, they see an additional need for um, particularly mental health supports. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick snapshot of the different agencies that are involved in the implementation team and each of the agencies that are listed here, um, the Center for School Safety, the Department of Criminal Justice Training, KDE, um, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, Department for Behavioral Health, um, the, the Division of Frisk, um, as well as the Kentucky Office of Homeland Security. All of these agencies have some role uh, specified in the School Safety and Resiliency Act. And many times, whatever they're supposed to be leading, um, they also are required to collaborate with some of the other agencies listed here. So that's why we created this team. Um, next slide, please. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, the legislation was passed um, in 2018. Uh, or sorry, the uh, the work the working group was um, in place during 2018, in between the the sessions, and during that time they they you know had um, visits all across the state where they heard from superintendents, um, director of pupil personnel or DPPs, school resource officers, um, students, teachers, counselors, family members, including the family members of the students. Um, who were killed at Marshall County High School. Um, and I really personally, having attended most of those, those working group meetings, saw that um, particularly the testimony from the students um, and what they spoke about with regard to um, mental health supports and different programs in their schools that helped support it, having a positive school climate culture made a real impact on the legislators. Um, in fact, I remember very specifically when we were in Trigg County, some of the students there talking about sources of strength um, and what a, a positive benefit it had been to their school. And then several other, you know, several meetings later, those legislators were still asking um, subsequent districts, well, do you have sources of strength in your school? Um, and I think that you could see from their interest that that uh, they really wanted to reflect um, some mental health supports in the legislation that was passed. So um, you can see there that um, the, the legislation that did pass uh, sort of took a two-pronged approach in terms of what they, they refer to as hardening their campuses through making you know, additional security, uh, take, taking additional security measures, but also softening the classrooms so to speak, by promoting the psychological well-being of students. So next slide, please. So this is just a quick snapshot of some of the different ways that the legislation tries to promote the physical safety of students, um, including controlling access to school buildings, um, both entrances and classrooms, um, requiring all the districts to have a school safety coordinator, um, establishing the Office of the State School Security Marshal and uh, requiring them to conduct annual on-site reviews um, using a school security risk assessment for every school in the state, um, requiring that SROs be assigned to every building, um, establishing school safety and threat assessment teams for every school, and then um, required active uh, active shooter training for school staff that's to be completed annually. Um, and then on the next slide, there's an overview of some of the aspects that relate to psychological safety of, of students. And so that includes um, suicide prevention training for all students grades six through 12, um, also suicide prevention training for any employees that work directly with students grades six through 12, and particularly focused on recognizing the signs and symptoms of a possible mental illness. Um, increasing the number of school counselors and school school based mental health services providers in schools. Um, I did see that uh, there was some some uh, verbiage in your draft recommendations around increasing mental health. And I will say that there has been um, 
although this the legislation was passed um, in a non-budget year, they did come back later and appropriate some funds <clears throat> to support hiring of school counselors and school-based mental health services providers. But when it was divided evenly among all of the districts, um, it, it came out to about $43,000 per district. And that might be enough for one counselor per school district. So you can probably do the math and think about the, the impact that one additional counselor or a school-based mental health services provider is able to, to do in your, in your schools. Um, another thing that this required was um, for the Department of Education to produce a trauma-informed toolkit. Um, and then accompanied with that is for local boards to adopt a plan for trauma-informed um, approaches to education in their schools. And then for each school to create a trauma-informed team to identify and support students as well as provide training um, to staff. And so there was a big emphasis clearly on trauma and, and um, efforts to um, help make schools overall more trauma informed. And then the, the final piece of that is really also encouraging communication between law enforcement and schools so that if they you know are called out to a um, a home or an accident or something like that, and there is a student um, present or who may have been um, impacted by that traumatic event that they can contact the, someone at the school and all they say is handle with care. Um, and that that school then knows that, okay, this student might need a little bit of extra support or attention that day because they may have experienced something very traumatic um, very recently. Next slide, please. Um, so another piece of the legislation um, that kind of, I think, uh, touches on both the physical safety and the psychological safety of students is the anonymous reporting tool, um, which was, we already had one in place through the Kentucky Center for School Safety, which was referred to as the stop tip line. And that um, the management of that tip line was transitioned over to the Kentucky Office of Homeland Security, and they made some additional tweaks to it. Um, and now they administer that tip line and they are continuing to work on um, making some additional enhancements to that tip line. So if you all have, I know that I saw a little bit of mention about that in the, the draft recommendations. So if you all have um, additional recommendations that you wanna include there, they're definitely open to um, taking an input because I think what we all want to see is students feeling they, they can use this tip line more. Um, one of the things that they've been working on is working on an app to make it easier to report tips. And then, um, and this, this, some of this information I'm sharing with you is from our very, our most recent um, implementation team meeting where we kind of talked about the status of the tip line. Um, and so they share that they they want to work on this app and they're also thinking about how they might be able to connect it to the nine new 988 system. Um, so if you're not familiar with 988, it is replacing the national suicide um, hotline to be a, a more user friendly or an easier to remember number, kind of like 911, but for mental health uh, crises. And so the idea is that perhaps we could connect this app to the 988 system so that if a, a young person calls um, the tip line, then they could be connected to 988 and get, get some access to mental health um, supports immediately. Next slide, please. So I won't read all of these, but um, these are some different ways that KDE is supporting some of the work related to um, what's in the School Safety and Resiliency Act. We've actually been doing a lot of work on um, helping schools and districts to become trauma-informed even before the legislation was passed, but I think that really laid a good foundation for the schools um, meeting the requirements of the School Safety and Resiliency Act. Um, that second piece there about positive behavior interventions and supports, that is some training that we've been providing um, to help infuse mental health services into some of the existing supports that are in schools um, promoting um, positive behaviors. Um, and then also how to help um, 
create some opportunities for districts to have um, contracts or memorandums of, of agreement with community mental health providers to make those uh, mental health referrals between schools and community mental health providers um, more uh, streamlined and, and collaborative. Um, and then we also offer training on the youth mental health first aid, sources of strength, um, bullying prevention, and some of those other things that you see there. Um, next slide, please. So the next, this piece is where um, we have some details about the trauma-informed toolkit and the training that we provide. Um, you can see the list of the tools that we have already released there, including how to ensure that um, we have, you know, certain uh, pieces in place to, so that lockdown drills or um, active shooter drills don't become um, traumatic events for people or that any people who may have already experienced some trauma related to um, an active intruder situation um, aren't, aren't re-triggered by some of the drills that are mandatory. Um, so that's a, just a quick overview. We, we continue to work on some additional resources around trauma-informed tools um, that we are continuing to put out. Um, I think one of the things that we're looking at is how to help um, respond to certain natural disasters and crises. We do have some resources out there, but they are not formally part of the trauma-informed toolkit. But I think obviously over the past several months, we've seen that there's a real need for that. Um, we also have been working for many years with UK's um, Center on Trauma and Children for, to provide free training to districts around this. Uh, next slide, please. So the trauma-informed team is something that is established at each school. And again, this is to provide uh, support to um, teachers, staff, and administrators all on how they can best be um, in support of students who may have experienced trauma. And it's their responsibility to help implement the trauma-informed plan that is approved by the district. So the next slide, please. So this is this is what's in the law requiring um, around the requirements for a trauma informed plan. So different strategies to enhance trauma awareness around the, throughout the school community, um, conducting climate school climate assessments, um, developing trauma informed discipline policies, and you may have seen noticed that we have um, a trauma informed tool in our toolkit around making sure that discipline uh, discipline policies are trauma informed. Again, collaborating with law enforcement on that handle with care uh, program, and then uh, just overall providing services and programs to reduce the negative impact of trauma um, on the school environment. Um, next slide, please. And I'll go over these last two pretty quickly because this is just um, the, the details around the, the legislation for um, the suicide prevention awareness training. Um, previously, the law referred to uh, just middle and high school, and they became more specific um, in terms of referring to grades 6 through 12 um, for <clears throat> the, the training component there. And then the next slide, um, this is the details around the active shooter training. Um, and as I mentioned, this training is only required for um, staff. It's not required for students, and we actually have um, a tool in our toolkit for ensuring that those are um, trauma-informed. So that's just a very quick rundown of the School Safety and Resiliency Act. Um, I don't know if there's time for questions or if we want to do that in the breakout groups, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and I see there may be some comments in the chat. Oops. Yeah, so I think um, Dr. Brewer, did you want to come on? And then I think the next uh, up thing we were going to do is just um, give talk about the projects a little bit. Dr. Brewer and Dr. Glass. Hi, Tony. Yes, just working to make sure I have the correct background. Okay, here we go. 
Um, so first off, I want to say um, you all have done a fantastic job working on this in the summer. So kudos to you for being <laughs> students who are willing to do research and write in the summer. So we already knew you were exceptional and you continue to prove that. Um, I'm going to put in the chat a Google document that sort of captures the current brief um, with the recommendations um, kind of divided in the three time frames that we spoke about in May. Um, so if you recall at um, the meeting we had in person, uh, Dr. Glass sort of proposed what sort of recommendations would we have um, to prevent a potential tragedy. So sort of before an event would occur, what would be recommendations um, should a tragedy be uh, occurring in, in one of our schools? What are some of the recommendations we would have to um, try to mitigate um, the damages and uh, loss of life? And then um, after an event, how do we support um, schools, districts, and communities to recover from, from an incident? So that's how the uh, brief is organized currently. Uh, we are going to split into groups, so um, each of you sort of picked one of those three groups to work in and make those recommendations. So we're going to review the current um, recommendations, talk about um, is there anything missing? Is there anything that um, maybe we need additional support? I know I mentioned in May that we want to be sure that our recommendations are uh, informed from the research, that they represent the best practices that we know. And, and Christina just shared um, some of those things we should consider. Um, also, we want to be sure that they are a fully formed recommendation, right? I think some of the recommendations are on the right track, uh, but maybe they need to be sort of placed in the context of um, our current school environment and, and some of the existing laws. Uh, we also uh, need to think about our use of research and making sure that we have the appropriate citations when we have pulled from an um, external source. I've made a few notes in the comments of the draft where um, some of you put parenthetical references, awesome, but we need to have the full reference. So it says, you know, where, where you got it from, what page, if it was um, a printed piece or if it was from a website, we need to make sure we reference back to that. And then I was unsure as I was sort of organizing what you all wrote, uh, what was a direct quote and what had perhaps been paraphrased. Uh, we'll want to be sure that we are avoiding plagiarizing anything that we did not write ourselves. So we'll want to go through and check on that. And then we do want to think about what Christina shared. Are any of the recommendations that have been made something that's already in place, that's already in law? Um, so we'll want to be sure that we don't um, make redundant recommendations. And then there's also a few um, other considerations for how we would want this to be presented to the legislature. You could decide in your groups that you also want to call out some policy recommendations that you've heard that as a group you would not be supportive of. So one of those examples would be arming teachers. And I'm sure you have heard that that is something that's been um, floating around uh, as a, a potential uh, response. If as a group you feel like that is something that you would be strongly opposed to, you may want to figure out a way to include that in your brief so that um, you make a point as to why uh, that would not be uh, something that the students would support, and here's the reasons, and we'd want to have a full rationale for that. So when we kind of get into our groups, you're each going to have a person in there to sort of help facilitate, um, but just as it was this summer, this is your project. Um, I did very minimal editing to what was there. You guys did a fantastic job pulling together your recommendations. Um, so. I want the students to, to lead the conversation if, if they um, are so inclined. Uh, again, we're trying to reach consensus, as Dr. Glass shared in May. Once the final draft is ready, then we'll want all of the students to weigh in on the final set of recommendations and confirm they are supportive of what has been drafted, right? So we'll wanna be sure that everyone feels comfortable with the final version. One last point, once we have our draft, uh, recommendations and we feel like they're in a pretty good state, then we'll need to work on the executive summary and the introduction. So just for those of you who 
um, are interested in sort of uh, a, a career in, in research, um, it is often helpful to write the introduction last, which seems um, to be sort of backward. But once you have an idea of what um, you want to recommend, then you can go back and, and provide the appropriate sort of summary of that in the introduction. So we'll need to have an executive summary and an introduction added in at the end. So does anyone have any questions about kind of how we'll proceed in the small groups um, so that we can begin thinking through um, where we wanna go in our revision stage? And just while they collect questions, just Megan for recording purposes, um, I'm not sure how you wanna do it. We'll come back um, after we we're done with breakouts, we'll come back into the main room. I expect it to be about uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. So that's what probably what I'll put down on the timer, about 15 minutes, um, and then we'll come back into the main room. So um, that's how it'll work. And then it'll take me about a minute or two to, to put you into your rooms. And if I see some of the KDE leadership staff I see is, is watching the meeting, I'll probably just randomly assign you to a room as well. So just FYI. And your leaders for the rooms, I think we have uh, Meredith or Dr. Brewer will be in the before incident, Dr. Glass will be in the during incident, and then Brian Perry, our um, Director of Government um, Relations, will be working with the after incident uh, for today. And then Christina um, Weeder, who you just heard from, is gonna kind of be floating, um, and then I'll be floating, and there'll be a couple of others um, floating as well. So just so you know that there, you know, several of us will be available, but those will be your kind of your leaders for each of the breakout groups. And Tony, I did just remember one more thing. You'll notice in the comments as well, there are a few um, additional notes, recommendations that were in the Google Docs that you all provided that you may want to consider adding. In some situations, that would be an additional recommendation that's not captured in sort of the text boxes in each section, um, or it would be something you may want to incorporate into an existing recommendation. So do pay attention to uh, those comments uh, because your um, fellow students have done some really good thinking in there. So that's captured in the comments. And Bentley, I will put you in before incident because I believe that's the one that you've been, I had you down for before and during. So I will put you in the before incident and I will um, put our ASL interpreters in that room uh, as well. Does that work okay for you? Perfect, thank you. All right, are we ready for breakouts? We are indeed. All right, cross your fingers. <laughs> All right, give me a moment. Uh, Meredith, how much time do we have in these breakouts once we get there? About 15 minutes. Okay. And I'll need to, I have a hard stop at 11. Okay. Perfect, thanks Madeline. And um, there was a recommendation in there around um, gun control laws and um, we didn't have any, it just was a statement that was in the Google document. So if that is something that you want to recommend, we will need some additional detail about kind of what specifically um, you feel like uh, you want to propose, and we'll want to make sure that we really dig into the literature on that and have a really strong um, support for that piece. So I, I called that out in the comments as well. So um, do pay attention to the comments. As I said, there are some, some guiding thoughts there. Jude, great question. Um, we can decide I, a lot of, of um, briefs will use footnotes. Uh, so APA will, will sort of work through the best way to get the citations in there. Right now, the primary objective is just to make sure we capture whenever the text was informed by an external source. So that's the big thing right now. I want to be sure that um, we have original thought. And if it's something that we learned from our research, that we give appropriate attribution. Question, uh, do any of y'all have a summary of the uh, uh, Federal Safer Communities Act? Or do you happen to have access to a summary for that? 
don't have a summary. We do have an article that I sent out. Um, actually, we also have a podcast that sort of walks through some of the recommendations, but I will um, try to find something that has a high level overview. Yeah, because I was just scrolling and it seems like it take me about three days to finish reading. <laughs> yeah, it's very long. <laughs> and despite the length, they feel the need to rename courthouses in an act about. I don't know. Anyway, so. Yeah, despite the length, there are some aspects that are still very. Um, limited in detail. Uh, this this bill actually is going to put a lot of money into a, a federal grant that my division administers, and we are desperate for the details because we can't do anything <laughs> until we get those. So. So just as a process check in, it doesn't seem like anybody's been assigned to any breakouts. Are we having some technical problems doing that? And do we need to come up with a different plan? He's working on I'm, it. I'm working on it. It's a process. Give me give me a moment. Okay. So if, while, while we sort of wait and we may, you know, teams may pull us into our groups here mid sentence, but um, as you've had a chance to kind of look, what are your initial reactions to the current draft? And certainly those of you that contributed this summer, if you want to speak to the thought process behind what you submitted, that would be helpful as well. If I may for a moment, my initial reaction is very good. I was unfortunately unable to work on it over the summer as I had a different opportunity occurring. But the main thing that I see is that there is a lack of substantive recommendations in the during incident portion in comparison to the other two portions. As I said, unfortunately, I'm, I was unable to work on it and receive this before the meeting, but before okay. it is submitted, I would assume that maybe more work could be done on that. Absolutely, that is a great observation, and um, we we agree. And so, Dr. Glass's group is going to dig in once they <laughs> they get into their breakout. Tony, does it look like we're we're about? Yeah, to it that looks one? like I'm about to open the breakouts. There's a couple of students that did not indicate before, during, or. Um, so you may have been randomly assigned. So congratulations, you've been assigned to a breakout. If if there are some that are left over, I will assign it. So I'm about to hit open the breakout. So hopefully you all are sorted uh, appropriately. I kind of feel like Harry Potter here. So we'll see what happens. Ravenclaw. Ravenclaw, that's me. All right, welcome back everyone. You should be coming back into the main room. Slowly but surely, everyone should be migrating back to our main main room. Hopefully, it seemed like everybody was <laughs> in their breakouts. <laughs> I was sweating sweating over here, but I think it worked out. So um, we had a little bit of issue with our phone users, but I think I eventually got everybody in their rooms. So my little wheel is still turning, so we're going to wait until once it stops turning. I think that means everybody has been migrated back into the main room. And I think uh, we have picked up on our recording. We were on a break for our um, webcast, so we'll just uh, Megan, let me know when we're back. You are good to go. Thank you. And we're still waiting um, for everybody to pop back in. It just takes a hot second. Looks like we're all back now. Uh, so, Dr. Brewer, would you like to maybe have a share out from each of the groups uh, from yes, you and Dr. Uh, Glass and Brian? Perfect. That would be perfect. Um, so we will go first because we had the Beaufort group. So we uh, had a chance to review um, the recommendations and, and Superstar Callie actually had added in over the weekend um, some thoughts around uh, the gun control recommendation. So you'll notice in the Google Doc, doc that some additional text appeared. Um, so. Overall, um, our group felt the recommendations uh, were 
reasonable, but Bentley, would you like to share or someone from, from group one about sort of what we talked through uh, and what we intend to add? Or anyone, I don't mean to pick on Bentley, anyone from our group want to share? I just saw you on camera. <laughs> I mean, you can, you were there. That's true, but this is the Student Advisory Council and we really all believe the students are far better <laughs> at all of this than we are. But um, anyone from, Callie, do you wanna kind of talk through what you added for those who are, um, haven't had a chance to look at that new section? Don't be shy sure. guys. So um, I talked about, um, ways to prevent um, people with mental illnesses to get a hold of certain firearms. So one way of doing that would be to require mental health screenings um, before the purchase of one. And currently um, background checks must be performed for anyone purchasing a firearm from a federally licensed, uh, licensed gun dealer. But um, I think that if we took a step further with that with mental health screenings, that would help a little bit more. Um, and I looked at some st statistics um, that show that in 37 mass shootings that have occurred between 1982 and 2019, 28 shooters um, that had survived and went to trial were diagnosed with some type of mental illness. Um, so I think if someone had been able to catch this um, before they had gained access to a gun, then we could have possibly prevented um, these incidents from happening. So, and I think um, more in our, in the more recent shootings that we've seen, um, we've, it, it's involved in mental health and the shooters. So I think um, that's a big part of, of gun safety. And tying on to what she says about mental health, um, like expanding access to mental health services in school is gonna play a huge part in that as well, considering that, over half of school shootings are performed by current or former students of the school of which the shooting took place and a large majority of those are then later diagnosed with the mental health disorder. We also um, we talked about the stop tip line and how like a lot of it's kind of when um, you like notice something weird and like you're not like oh like let me call 911 because you're like worried that it's not like you know enough or like it wasn't anything it's not a big deal and so we talked about really getting over like the barriers to even like tipping something off and like um, making sure students know if you are even considering this then it's probably something you should just tip off just in case um, I think it's really important to be more I guess transparent about like what happens with like this tip that you give if that makes sense because I feel like a lot of times it tends to feel like it goes into the void and you don't know if there's really anyone like looking at it or noticing it or addressing it and that can be very difficult for students if they if we want them to take it if we, um, if we want them to take it seriously um, and then the other thing we talked about was um, we talked about in our second recommendation about like bullying, we mentioned that as a problem, but we don't necessarily do anything to like address bullying in schools and like that feeling of like being outcasted or not necessarily like in um, with like other students. So that's something that we're planning on adding. Um, so we have a comment about that. And we did also have a comment in the sort of introduction section that we probably want student mental health to be kind of a um, unifying theme throughout the recommendations. Um, in the after an incident, there's a lot of recommendations around student mental health, but from the preventative perspective, we also feel it is important to have access to student mental health or mental health professionals in schools and that we're addressing student mental health um, Kind of in, in the creation of a safe school environment. All right, Dr. Glass, your team is up next. Thank you. 
I did just drop in the chat. Hopefully people will be able to read it. Um, there was an article in the New York Times just yesterday about this concept of mental illness and as a, using it as a predictor for mass shootings and uh, showing that it's, uh, uh, the article goes into some detail to really sh show that it's it's not a good indicator because mental health is so underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed that it's hard to use that as any sort of predictor. Uh, so that might be something that's um, useful or uh, uh in in the work of the first group uh just coming up so um and that that came out just yesterday that article um so our, our group um was the during the event uh group and so we talked a lot about um the the active shooter drills and the really preparing for what might happen and some concerns around how we balance uh, making those sort of more realistic and have students take them seriously versus uh, the trauma that a realistic experience might create and and trying to find the balance through that. So we had some conversations um, around that. We talked some about um, supports for first responders um, and wondered what uh, drills or exercises they did in preparation for an active shooter. So are all po local police forces prepared for this? And uh, talk some about the situation in Uvalde where you had the police standing outside the door for over an hour. Um, and which, you know, we now uniformly know that that's not the appropriate procedure when it comes to law enforcement responding, but that nevertheless that happened um, in, in Texas and how do we prevent that from happening again? Things like access to the building, does the does the um, the first responders have access to keys and blueprints and how could they get on those, uh, get into buildings? Uh, we needed to find more information around what are the training that SROs have during uh, active shooter situations because we weren't really sure about all that, uh, so we needed to learn more about that. We believe that it's part of their training, but um, that might be something that we uh, find out more about. We added information too about uh, how communications would could be improved during an actual event. Um, so what uh, so that people in the building have a better understanding of what's going on. Uh, there may be um, coded language that may have to be used so you can communicate with uh, students and staff, uh, but the shooter um, or the assailant uh, do, doesn't have inform have information, so that's that's difficult because as, as was mentioned by the first group, oftentimes it's a former st or current student is the shooter, so they understand all the procedures uh, in the building, and that's that is a significant problem. But um, thinking about what are best practices when it comes to communicating with uh, people in the building, the students and the staff uh, about what's what's going on. So those are that's kind of the range of the conversation that we had in the time that we had. We started to fill in some more information uh, into these, um, but we know that we've got to go back and uh, add, add uh, even more uh, things to think about. So I'll stop there and see if there are any members of my group that also want to add in um, things that we talked about that maybe I missed. Go ahead, Nyla. Were you in group two? I was. Um, okay. One thing, I mean, yes, he did talk about all that stuff that he did, and it was very important that we got to those topics. Um, but another topic that we discussed was um, like the time and matter, like the things are done and executed, um, because as he brought up the Texas shooting, um, they did, didn't did have it done in a timely matter. And I feel as if, if they had the right time and preparation to do everything, the situation would have turned it out, may, not as bad, but um, under different circumstances. So making sure that re, um, reinforcement and stuff is done in a timely matter was something that we were also going to add. Thank you. All right, I think that wraps it up for us. So we'll turn it to the uh, post event group. Okay, hey, Brian. You're on mute. So we just talked a little bit about what the group is currently has in the draft and talked about uh, fleshing out mostly what they have uh, so far and not trying to add more to it. Um, the, I think there's a couple that are going to go back and uh, work on cleaning up all the citations. Um, there's a really interesting section about the uh, what do you do with the building after the fact, right? And so uh, we posted a couple of links 
uh, for them to look at uh, because there has been some conversation following Uvalde about whether or not schools are repaired um, and reused or whether they are torn down and uh, a new school is built. So I think that's a really interesting section. Uh, they have a really good section about the about two different uh, trauma informed counseling models, uh, one for younger students and one for older students. Um, and so I suggested that they look at fleshing that out a little bit in terms of you know what how do how do those services get provided to the community after the incident uh, maybe links to the actual providers if there's you know web web pages for them um, that sort of thing and then we also talked a little bit about uh, how the potential uh, expansion of the tip line into an app uh, could help provide those mental health services so we posted a link to the safe utah app which is the model that's being looked at by a few of the legislators um, looking at this so that's the quick overview, do any of the uh, group members have anything to add? Here, I'm going to jump in and say we didn't include this in the summary, but it was in our group C thing. And after we finish like revising all the other sections, we might add this, but basically how to prevent like PTSD and trauma when they have to go through these active shooter drills again, just because they are required. And we think that's super important because Maybe if they like feel like they've healed and then they have to go through the shooting drill again, it might just bring everything back and take steps backwards. Really good. That's a really good point. Yes. Tony and I are like <laughs> echoes of each other today. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, we know that Dr. Glass has a hard stop at 11. I do kind of want to talk about next steps. Um, so Brian will be the one who will be currying this over to um, the legislature. So um, Brian has said that hopefully early October would be kind of the drop dead date for um, our completion of this. And so anytime before that would be all the better for us to work to make sure we have consensus. So I think we should really aim for mid to third week of September um, to try to have our additional uh, thoughts added in, all of our citations. We'll want to make sure everything is appropriately documented, and then we do need to work on um, the introduction and executive summary. As I shared with my group, the reason we have kind of the recommendation boxes and why we want to have an executive summary, since our primary audience will be the General Assembly, we want to make sure that we have our recommendations clearly listed and um, a good summary in case they're doing a quick review of, of what is proposed, but we want the longer uh, text for the support and, and to show the rationale. So um, Brian, anything you wanna share there as they're sort of thinking through the drafting as far as our intended audience and, and what might be uh, important to consider? Uh, not particularly. Uh, the executive summary will be really important because not all 138 members are going to read the full report. Uh, a lot of them will look at the executive summary first and foremost. So uh, you definitely want a really strong, we call them one pagers, right? So your executive summary probably shouldn't exceed one page um, and probably not just full text, you know, bullet points, highlights, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think that's the, that's probably the most critical part. Um, and then just thinking about being able to explain it if someone were to ask you, you know, about particularly about the sections you're working on. So be able to start thinking about being able to answer questions. So we'll continue to work in the sort of method that we have been. So I will schedule some additional work sessions where we'll be available um, kind of office hour style for you to pop in and ask questions. Uh, we'll also share um, via email, Tony, if, if that's good with your team, this Google document again. And so we'll kind of transition from the individual group documents to this one document that way then we can avoid some redundant recommendations and we're kind of working on um, the current version. Uh, but we do want to try to aim for uh, mid-September to have a draft that we can share and um, get kind of final review. Christina, if you're still on, um, we certainly value your team's support on this, so we'll make sure that your team um, reviews and, and provides feedback for the students as we think through kind of the final set of recommendations. Um, Dr. Glass, anything else you want to add on this um, policy brief and, and how we're going to proceed? That, no, it sounds great. I think we made some good progress today, uh, Meredith, and uh, the, I think the legislators will really appreciate 
uh, this information coming from the perspective of students. I think we've got a lot of work to do. Um, uh, so let's be uh, clear eyed about that. But uh, this group always uh, impresses and, and comes through. So I, I feel confident that we'll we'll pull together as we move forward here. And I just want to add to from the communication standpoint, you know, you are, you know, we have you the stu to our students, you know, you, we we work really well with all the other offices. So don't fret about the one pager just yet. We we can work. That's kind of our area of taking what you provide and and you work with our offices to provide and we can, you know, kind of, you know, get it down to one page or one a back and front and make it look good and all that stuff. So don't worry about all that stuff. Work on getting the great content in there and that that comes after so we can we can help you with that that's that don't fret about that i think a lot of people start to think about oh, what's it going to look like what you know how's it going to look on a page don't fret about that we are not there yet um when we get to that point we can really help you with that great job everyone um we really do value your perspectives and that's why it's so important that we get this document um, finalized and, and into the hands of our, our legislators because we want them to to hear from from students how they are feeling about this really important topic. Okay, all right, thanks all. I think um, Brian and Dr. Glass are going to are speaking of the General Assembly are off to go meet with some of our General Assembly members. So uh, good luck with that. Um, and then we just have one more agenda item. Uh, for you all and it should go quick and then you all can get back to class. So thank you, Brian and Dr. Glass uh, for your time this morning. Um, and then uh, we'll follow back up with you on uh, next steps for this process. Thanks guys. All right, next up is Audrey um, from the communications team. And she's gonna just share with you, uh, we have a couple of opportunities for student voice and communications and she's gonna go over those with you, Audrey. Yeah, hi everyone. So excited to talk with you all. I love working with this group, so um, really excited to be here. I just wanted to talk to you all really quick about some communication opportunities to our new members, and I'll be sure to share this information too, because um, I know it's been a long um, and productive session today. Um, so we have a couple opportunities. We talked uh, about one really quick earlier with Hunter and that's guest columns. So if you ever have something you feel like you want to write about concerning um, anything in schools or education world, feel free to reach out to us and, and just kind of run your idea by us and we can talk you through it and see how that goes. Um, we also worked with last year Rocks. They wrote an awesome column about mental health. So did um, uh, so Liana, she wrote one about mental health. So anything that you might want to talk about, uh, I know um, like World Mental Health Day is coming up in October. So if anybody wants to talk about that, um, if there's just something you have going on in school, um, again, the topics can range from anything that you want to talk about. I know a couple of you all are doing like college credit classes this year. So maybe if you even wanted to write about that and the benefit of that opportunity to you as a student. Um, and the second thing I wanted to talk to you all about is we're going to um, be talking a little bit more about this later, but follow uh, you guys have an account on Twitter. It's called at KDE Stu Voice. Um, Caleb, who used to be on the council before and is now interning with us, has been live tweeting this meeting. Um, so we're trying to get that account um, up and going. So I encourage you all to follow it. Also to fill out the getting to know the SAC Google form. If you haven't done that already, I'll be sure to include that in the exit slip. As just a reminder, we want to introduce each of y'all. Um, and so if you have any questions about the social media, just reach out to us and we can help. Or if you want to help us, I know um, a few people maybe expressed interest to Tony about that. Feel free to reach out about helping us with that too. Um, and that's about all I have for right now until we meet again in September. And then just as a follow up, Justin, I think has already reached out uh, on a potential um, topic, so we will work on that. It has been really, really busy um, for us just with the opening of school. And then, as we mentioned earlier, with just providing that support to our um, to our, our school districts in eastern Kentucky and the continued support that we're providing to our districts in western Kentucky, it's been a really um, it's just been a really tough year for many of our families and communities across the state. 
Um, and we play a really big role in trying to be um, a connector for our school districts and our families uh, in, uh, with federal funding and, and various pockets of, of state funding and, and resources. So, um, you know, please, if you come across uh, an idea on how to, to, how to help our um, fellow students and staff in different parts of the state, please reach out um, if you have an idea to write about that. Sometimes writing is good therapy, so just let us know how we can um, we can get that published for you. Um, one other thing I wanted to uh, mention, and I think I've already lost it, so I may have to just follow up in the email because it's been a long day. <laughs> so um, I don't have the date for the next meeting. It's It should be the third. Um, I think we're trying to do the fourth Saturday in September. But all of the meetings for this year should be held on your calendars already. Um, I believe the in-person meeting, um, those two have already been marked already. So um, all of those will be shared on the Google Doc uh, or on the yeah, on the Google Doc at the Google form that we will be sending out for feedback. Um, please fill out the feedback form, uh, the exit slip immediately following this meeting. I know it takes, it, you know, I know you're in school, but sometime today, just while it's fresh in your mind, because we do use that um, and we want to make sure that we're um, keeping these meetings up to date and um, with important topics that are uh, valuable to you and, and having uh, feedback that's uh, important to you as well. So any other questions? If anybody has anything, please raise your hand or put something in the chat and I'll make sure we get to your questions. All right. We'll have a wonderful start to your school year. For those of you that are back in school, I know we have a couple of districts that have not started uh, due to some construction issues or um, due to flooding. So um, I am Dr. Glass and I and um, Dr. Lou Young will be uh, visiting some schools in Eastern Kentucky next week. So we're looking forward um, to just kind of meeting with our, our districts and families in, in the Eastern part of the state. And then we look forward to um, hearing more about your uh, school safety project in the next couple of weeks. Um, stay safe. See you next time. Thank you.